What use is it now? Hush, hush, Alexey Fyodorovitch, for I have so much to say to you that I am afraid I shall tell you nothing. This awful trial, I shall certainly go. I am making arrangements. I shall be carried there in my chair. Besides, I can sit up. I shall have people with me. And you know I am a witness. How shall I speak? How shall I speak? I don't know what I shall say. One has to take an oath. Hasn't one? Yes. But I don't think you will be able to go. I can sit up. Are you put me out? This trial, this savage act, and then they are all going to Siberia. Some are getting married, and all this so quickly, so all grow old and have death to look forward to. Well, so be it. I am weary. This Katia, set charmant person, has disappointed all my hopes. Now she is going to follow one of your brothers to Siberia, and your other brother is going to follow her, and will live in the nearest town, and they will all torment one another. It drives me out of my mind. Worst of all, the publicity. The story has been told a million times over in all the papers in Moscow and Petersburg. Ah, yes. Would you believe it? There's a paragraph that I was a dear friend of your brother's. I can't repeat the horrid word. Just fancy, just fancy, impossible. Where was the paragraph? What did it say? I'll show you. Where directly. I got the paper and read it yesterday. Here, in the Petersburg paper gossip. The paper began coming out this year. I am awfully fond of gossip, and I take it in. And now it pays me out. This is what gossip comes to. Here it is. Here, this passage. Read it. And she handed Alyosha a sheet of newspaper which had been under her pillow. It was not exactly that she was upset. She seemed overwhelmed, and perhaps everything really was mixed up in a tangle in her head. The paragraph was very typical, and must have been a great shock to her, but fortunately, perhaps, she was unable to keep her mind fixed on any one subject at that moment, and so might race off. Alyosha was well aware that the story of the terrible case had spread all over Russia. And, good heavens, what wild rumors about his brother, about the Karamazovs, and about himself he had read in the course of those two months, among other equally credible. Another contradicted this, and stated that he and his elder, Father Zosima, had broken into the monastery chest and made tracks from the monastery. The present paragraph in the paper gossip, I had hitherto kept it concealed. It was brief, and Madame Holakov was not directly mentioned in it. No names appeared, in fact. It was merely stated that the criminal, whose approaching trial was making such a sensation, retired army captain, an idle swaggerer, and reactionary bully was continually, but the criminal, counting on escaping punishment, had preferred to murder his father to get the three thousand rather than go off to Siberia with the middle-aged charms of his pining lady. This playful paragraph finished, of course, with an outburst of generous indignation, at the wickedness of parricide, and at the lately abolished institution of serfdom. Reading it with curiosity, Alyosha folded up the paper and handed it back to Madame Holeko. Well, that must be me, she hurried on again. Of course I am meant. Scarcely more than an hour before, I suggested gold mines to him, and here they talk of middle-aged charms as though that were my motive. He writes that out of spite, God Almighty, you know I turned him out of the house. Out, out of the house. You know all that story, don't you? I know that you asked him not to visit you for the future, but why it was I haven't heard from you, at least. And then you've heard it from him. He abuses me, I suppose, abuses me dreadfully. Yes, he does, but then he abuses. But why you've given him up I haven't heard from him either. I meet him very seldom now. Indeed, we are not friends. Well, then, I'll tell you all about it. There's no help for it, I'll confess, for there is one point in which I was perhaps to blame. Only a little, little point, so little that perhaps it doesn't count. You see, 
My dear boy, Madame Holyko suddenly looked arch and a charming, though enigmatic, smile played about her lips, you see, I suspect. Though, you must forgive me, Alyosha. I am like a mother to you. I am a mother, you, oh, mother, oh, I am a mother, you, forgive me. No, no, quite the contrary. I speak to you now as though you were my father mother's quite out of place. Well, it's as though I were confessing to Father Zosima. That's just it. I called you a monk just now. Well, that poor young man, your friend, Rakitin, mercy on us. I can't be angry with him. I feel cross, but not very. That frivolous young man, would you believe it? seems to have taken it into his head to fall in love with me. I only noticed it later. At first a month ago, he only began to come oftener to see me, almost every day. Though, of course, we were acquainted before. I knew nothing about it, and suddenly it dawned upon me, and I began to notice things with surprise. You know, two months ago, that modest, charming, excellent young man, Pyotr Ilyich Prohotin, who's in the service here, began to be a regular visitor at the house. You met him here ever so many times yourself. And he is an excellent, earnest young man, isn't he? He comes once every three days, not every day, though I should be glad to see him every day, and always so well dressed. Altogether, I love young people, Alyosha, talented, modest, like you, and he has almost the mind of a statesman. He talks so charmingly, and I shall certainly. He is a future diplomat. On that awful day, he almost saved me from death by coming in the night. And your friend Rakitin comes in such boots, and always stretches them out on the carpet. He began hinting at his feelings, in fact, and one day, as he was going, he squeezed my hand terribly hard. My foot began to swell directly after he pressed my hand like that. He had met Pyotr Ilyich here before, and would you believe it, he is always gaping at him, rolling at him, for some reason. I simply looked at the way they went on together and laughed inwardly. So I was sitting here alone, no, I was laid up then. Well, I was lying here alone and suddenly Rakitin comes in and only fancy brought me some verses of his own composition, a short poem, on my bad foot. That is, he dis- Wait a minute, how did it go? A captivating little foot. It began somehow like that. I can never remember poetry. I've got it here. I'll show it to you later. But it's a charming thing, charming. And you know, it's not only about the foot. It had a good moral, too, a charming idea, only I've forgotten it, in fact. So, of course, I thanked him, and he was evidently flattered. I'd hardly had time to thank him when in comes Pyotr Ilyich, and Rakitin suddenly looked as black as night. I could see that Pyotr Ilyich was in the way, for Rakitin certainly wanted to say something after giving me the verses. I had a presentiment of it. But Pyotr Ilyich came in. I showed Pyotr Ilyich the verses and didn't say who was the author. But I am convinced that he guessed, though he won't own it to this day, and declares he had no idea. But he says that on purpose. Pyotr Ilyich began to laugh at once and fell to criticizing it. A wretched doggerel. He said they were, some divinity student must have written them, and with such vehemence, such vehemence, then, instead of laughing, your friend, good gracious, I thought, they'll fly at each other. It was I who wrote them, said he. I wrote them as a joke, he said, for I think it degrading to write verses. For I think it de 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 degrading to... But they are good poetry. They want to put a monument to your Pushkin for writing about women's feet, while I wrote with a moral purpose. And you, said he, are an advocate of serfdom. You've no humane ideas, said he. You have no modern enlightened feelings. You are uninfluenced by progress. You are a mere official. He said, and you take bribes. 
Then I began spree, and you know Pyotr Ilyich is anything but a coward. He at once took up the most gentlemanly tone, looked at him sarcastically, listened, and apologized. I'd no idea, said he. I shouldn't have said it if I had known. I should have praised it. Poets are all so irritable, he said. In short, he laughed at him under cover of the most gentlemanly tone. He explained to me afterwards that it was all sarcastic. I thought he was in earnest. Only as I lay there, just as before you now, I thought, would it or would it not be the proper thing for me to turn Rakitin out for shouting so rudely at a visitor in my house? I kept worrying and worrying, and my heart began to beat, and I couldn't make up my mind whether to make an outcry or not. One voice seemed to be telling me, speak, and the other, no, don't speak, and no sooner had the second voice said that than I cried out and fainted. Of course, there was a fuss. I got up suddenly and said to Rakitin, it's painful for me to say it, but I don't wish to see you in my house again, so I turned him out. Ah, Alexey Fyodorovich, I know myself I did wrong. I was putting it on. I wasn't angry with him at all, really. But I suddenly fancied that was what did it that it would be such a fine scene. That is a, is a sudden way. And yet, believe me, it was quite natural, for I really shed tears and cried for several days afterwards, and then suddenly, one afternoon, I forgot all about it. So it's a fortnight since he's been here, and I kept wondering whether he would come again. I wondered even yesterday. Then suddenly last night came this gossip. I read it and gasped. Who could have written it? He must have written it. He went home, sat down, wrote it on the spot, sent it, and they put it in. It was a fortnight ago, you see. But, Alyosha, it's awful how I keep talking and don't say what I want to say. Ah, the words come of themselves. It's very important for me to be in time to see my brother today, Elyosha faltered. To be sure, to be sure, you bring it all back to me. Listen, what is an aberration? What aberration? Asked Elyosha, wondering. In the legal sense. An aberration in which everything is pardonable. Whatever you do, you will be acquitted at once. What do you mean? I'll tell you. This Katia, ah, she is a charming, charming creature. Only I never can make out who it is she is in love with. She was with me some time ago, and I couldn't get anything out of her. Especially as she won't talk to me except on the surface now. She is always talking about my health and nothing else, and she takes up such a tone with me, too. I simply said to myself, Well, so be it. I don't care. Oh, yes. I was talking of aberration. This doctor has come. You know a doctor has come. Of course, you know it the one who discovers madmen. You wrote for him. No, it wasn't you but Katia. It's all Katia's doing. Well, you see, a man may be sitting perfectly sane and suddenly have an aberration. He may be conscious and know what he is doing and yet be in a state of aberration. And there's no doubt that Mitri Fyodorovich was suffering from aberration. They found out about aberration as soon as the law courts were reformed. It's all the good effect of the reformed law courts. The doctor has been here and questioned me about that evening, about the gold mines. How did he seem then? He asked me. He must have been in a state of aberration. He came in shouting, Money, money, three thousand, give me three thousand and then went away and immediately did the murder. I don't want to murder him, he said, and he suddenly went and murdered him. That's why they'll acquit him, because he struggled against it, and yet he murdered him. But he didn't murder him, Alyosha interrupted rather sharply. He felt more and more sick with anxiety and impatience. Yes, I know it was that old man Grigory murdered him. Grigory, cried Alyosha. Yes, yes, it was Grigory. He lay as Mitri Fyodorovich struck him down, and then got up, saw the door open. 
went in and killed Fyodor Pavlovich. But why, why, suffering from aberration, when he recovered from the blow Dmitri Fyodorovich gave him on the head, he was suffering from aberration. He went and committed the murder. As for his saying he didn't, he very likely doesn't remember. Only you know it'll be better, ever so much better, if Dmitri Fyodorovich murdered him. And that's how it must have been, though I say it was Grigory. It certainly was Dmitri Fyodorovich, and that's better, ever so much better. Oh, not better that a son should have killed his father. I don't defend that. Children ought to honor their parents, and yet it would be better if it were he, as you'd have nothing to cry over then, for he did it when he was unconscious, or rather when he was conscious, but did not know what. Let them acquit him that's so humane, and would show what a blessing reformed law courts are. I knew nothing about it, but they say they have been so a long time. And when I heard it yesterday, I was so struck by it that I wanted to send for you at once. And if he is acquitted, make him come straight from the law courts to dinner with me, and I'll have a party of friends, and we'll drink to the reformed law courts. I don't believe he'd be dangerous. Besides, I'll invite a great many friends, so that he could always be let out if he did anything. And then he might be made a justice of the peace or something in another town, for those who have been in trouble themselves make the best judges. And, besides, who isn't suffering from aberration nowadays? You, I, all of us are in a state of aberration, and there are ever so many examples of it. A man sits sick. I read that lately, and all the doctors confirm it. The doctors are always confirming. They confirm anything. Why, my lice is in a state of aberration. She made me cry again yesterday, and the day before, too, and today I suddenly realized that it's all due to aberration. Oh, lice grieves me so. I believe she's quite mad. Why did she send for you? Did she send for you, or do you come of yourself? She sent for me, and I am just going to her. Alyosha got up resolutely. Oh, my dear, dear Alexey Fyodorovich, perhaps that's what's most important. Madame Holikov cried suddenly bursting into tears. God knows I trust lice to you with all my heart, and it's no matter her sending for you on the sly, without telling her mother. But forgive me, I can't trust my daughter so easily to your brother Ivan Fyodorovich, though I still consider him the most chivalrous young man. But only fancy. He's been to see lies and I knew nothing about it how. What when? Alyosha was exceedingly surprised. He had not sat down again and listened standing. I will tell you. That's perhaps why I asked you to come, for I don't know now why I did ask you to come. Well, Ivan Fyodorovich has been to see me twice, since he came back from Moscow. First time he came as a friend to call on me, and the second time Katia was here and he came because he heard she was here. I didn't, of course, expect him to come often. Knowing what a lot he has to do as it is, Vaus Comprenez set a fair at La Mort Terrible devoter paper. But I suddenly heard he'd been here again, not to see me but to see lice. That's six days ago now. He came, stayed five minutes, and went away. And I didn't hear of it till three days afterwards, from Glafara, so it was a great shock to me. I sent for lice directly. She laughed. He thought you were asleep, she said, and came in to me to ask after your health. Of course, that's how it happened. But lice, lice, mercy on us, how she distresses me. Would you believe it one night, four days ago, just after you saw her last time, and had gone away? She suddenly, she suddenly screamed out, I hate Ivan Fyodorovich. I insist on your never letting him come to the house again. I was struck dumb at these amazing words, and answered, on what grounds could I refuse to see such an excellent young man? Well, I was pleased. I thought I had amused her and the fits would pass off, especially as I wanted to refuse to see Ivan Fyodorovich anyway on account of his strange visits without my knowledge. But early this morning Lice waked up and flew into a passion with Yulia, and, would you believe it, slapped her in the face. That's monstrous. 
I am always polite to my servants. And an hour later she was hugging Yulia's feet and kissing them. She sent a message to me that she wasn't coming to me at all, and would never come and see me again, and when I dragged myself down to her she rushed to kiss me, crying, and as she kissed me, Now, dear Alexey Fyodorovitch, I rest all my hopes on you, and of course my whole life is in your hands. I simply beg you to go to Lice and find out everything from her, as you alone can, and come back and tell me, me, her mother, for you understand it will be the death of me. Simply, I can stand no more. I have patience. But I may lose patience, and then, then something awful will happen. Ah, dear me, at last, Pyotr Ilyich, cried Madame Holikov, beaming all over as she saw Perhotin enter the room. You are late, you are late. Well, sit down, speak, put us out of suspense. What does the council say? Where are you off to, Alexey Fyodorovitch? To lice. Oh, yes. You won't forget. You won't forget what I asked you. It's a question of life and death, of course. I won't forget if I can. But I am so late, muttered Alyosha, beating a hasty retreat. No, be sure. Be sure to come in, don't say, if you can. I shall die if you don't. Madame Holakov called after him but Alyosha had already left the room. Chapter I. A little demon going into lies, he found her half reclining in the invalid chair, in which she had been wheeled when she was unable to walk. She did not move to meet him, but her sharp, keen eyes were simply riveted on his face. There was a feverish look in her eyes, her face was pale and yellow. Alyosha was amazed at the change that had taken place in her in three days. She was positively thinner. She did not hold out her hand to him. He touched the thin, long fingers which lay motionless on her dress. Then he sat down facing her, without a word. I know you are in a hurry to get to the prison, Lice said curtly, and Mamma's kept you there for hours. She's just been telling you about me and Yulia. How do you know? asked Alyosha. I've been listening. Why do you stare at me? I want to listen, and I do listen. There's no harm in that. I don't apologize. You are upset about something. On the contrary, I am very happy. I've only just been reflecting for the thirtieth time what a good thing it is I refused you and shall not be your wife. You are not fit to be a husband. If I were to marry you and give you a note to take to the man I loved after you, you'd take it and be sure to give it to him and bring an answer back. Two, if you were forty, you would still go on taking my love letters for me. She suddenly laughed. There is something spiteful and yet open-hearted about you. Alyosha smiled to her. The open-heartedness consists in my not being ashamed of myself with you. What's more, I don't want to feel ashamed with you, just with you. Alyosha, why is it I don't respect you? I am very fond of you, but I don't respect you, babe. If I respected you, I shouldn't talk to you without shame, should I? No. But do you believe that I am not ashamed with you? No, I don't believe it. Lice laughed nervously again. I sent your brother, Dmitri Fyodorovich, some sweets in prison. Alyosha, you know, you are quite pretty. I shall love you awfully for having so quickly allowed me not to love you. Why did you send for me today? Lice. I should like someone to torture me, marry me, and then torture me, deceive me, and go away. I don't want to be happy. You are in love with disorder. Yes, I want disorder. I keep wanting to set fire to the house. I keep imagining how I'll creep up and set fire to the house on the sly. It must be on the sly. They'll try to put it out, but it'll go on burning. And I shall know and say nothing. Of what silliness, and how bored I am, she waved her hand with a look of repulsion. It's your luxurious life, said Alyosha, softly. Is it better, then, to be poor? Yes, it is better. That's what your monk taught you. That's not true. Let me be rich and all the rest poor. I'll eat sweets and drink cream and not give any to anyone else. 
Ach, don't speak, don't say anything. She shook her hand at him, though Alyosha had not opened his mouth. You've told me all that before. I know it all by heart. It bores me. If I am ever poor, I shall murder somebody, and even if I am rich, I may murder someone. Perhaps why do nothing? But do you know, I should like to reap? He says, why live in real life? It's better to dream. One can dream the most delightful things. But real life is a bore. But he'll be married soon for all that. He's been making love to me already. Can you spin tops? Yes. Well, he's just like a top. He wants to be wound up and set spinning and then to be lashed, lashed, lashed with a whip. If I marry him, I'll keep him spinning all his life. You are not ashamed to be with me? No. You are awfully cross, because I don't talk about holy things. I don't want to be holy. What will they do to one in the next world for the greatest sin? You must know all about that. God will censure you. Alyosha was watching her steadily. That's just what I should like. I would go up and they would censure me, and I would burst out laughing in their faces. I should dreadfully like to set fire to the house, Alyosha, to our house. You still don't believe me? Why, there are children of twelve years old who have a longing to... It's a sort of disease. That's not true, that's not true. There may be children, but that's not what I mean. You take evil for good. It's a passing crisis. Ah, uh, how nice it would be if everything were destroyed. You know, Alyosha. I sometimes think of doing a fearful lot of harm and everything bad, and I should do it for a long while and Every one will stand round and point their fingers at me, and I would look at them all. That would be awfully nice. Why would it be so nice? Alyosha, I don't know. It's a craving to destroy something good or, as you say, to set fire to something. It happens sometimes. I not only say it, I shall do it. I believe you. Ah, how I love you for saying you believe me. And you are not lying one little bit. But perhaps you think that I am saying all this on purpose to annoy you. No, I don't think that. Though perhaps there is a little desire to do that in it too. There is a little. I never can tell lies to you. She declared with a strange fire in her eyes. What struck Alyosha above everything was her earnestness. There was not a trace of humor or jesting in her face now, though in old days. Fun and gaiety never deserted her even at her most earnest moments. There are moments when people love crime, said Alyosha thoughtfully. Yes, yes, you have uttered my thought. They love crime. Every one loves crime. They love it always, not at some moments. You know, it's... They all declare that they hate evil, but secretly they all love it. And are you still reading nasty books? Yes. I am. Mamma reads them and hides them under her pillow, and I steal them. Aren't you ashamed to destroy yourself? I want to destroy myself. There's a boy here, who lay down between the railway lines when the train was passing. Lucky fellow, listen. Your brother is being tried now for murdering his father, and every one loves his having killed his father. Loves his having killed his father. Yes, I for one love it. There is some truth in what you say about every one, said Alyosha softly. Oh, what ideas you have, Lice shrieked in delight. And you a monk, too. You wouldn't believe how I respect you, Alyosha, for never telling lies. Oh, I must tell you a funny dream of mine. I sometimes dream of devils. It's night. I am in my room with a candle, and suddenly there are devils all over the place, in all the corners under the table, and they open the doors. There's a crowd of them, and they are just coming, just seizing me. But I suddenly cross myself, and they all draw back, though they don't go away altogether. They stand at the doors and in the corners, waiting. And suddenly I have a frightful longing to revile God aloud, and so I begin. And then they come crowding back to me, delighted, and seize me again, and I cross myself again, and...
It's awful fun. It takes one's breath away. I've had the same dream, too, said Alyosha suddenly. Really, cried Lice, surprised. I say, Alyosha, don't laugh. That's awfully important.